Okay, a warm uh, welcome everyone to this session on bridging science and policy making within the 2030 agenda. Uh, the session is organized by SWEDE, the Swedish Development Researchers Network, uh, and uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and myself, Janet Vahemeki, and Mons Fellesen are moderating the session. And we have uh, a very nice audience here, and I would very much welcome you to interact with us on this topic, and a very prominent panel that we will present later. Uh, so why this topic? Uh, it's uh, science-based decision-making uh, is highlighted as very important in both the 2030 Agenda and Financing for Development Agenda, Addis Ababa Action Agenda. Uh, it's argued that science and research are needed for innovation, uh, but also for helping us to understand why something succeeds or something does not succeed, and why, what happens in implementation of different policies. Uh, therefore, both in the international agreements as well as in, in the Swedish policy, for, policy platform for development, it is said that Sweden should build broad engagements with academia, uh, research institutes and uh, uh, the, the education institutes, uh, and that these institutions should possess knowledge of complex context that links partly explain the varying causes of poverty and the form it takes. So the commitments both stress the importance of possessing and developing knowledge, but also increasing partnerships and interaction with academia. Uh, for Swedev, these questions have been a basis for our work. We're a network uh, uh, trying to connect both researchers in between each other and researchers with policy makers. Uh, and we currently have around 800 researchers connected to the network. Uh, and uh, uh, around 200 reg registered members. We're led by a steering committee consisting of 12 institutional support members, members and have a secretariat at SCI. So, uh, as a basis for this dialogue and for SWEDE, we have conducted two studies. One uh, was a study uh, where we did a, re st um, a survey on the development research community, a survey that went out to the 578 practitioner of uh, researchers who responded to the survey, and another one that went out to the policy-making community on how they perceive uh, research. And uh, both of these studies um, address uh, similar findings. A finding is that neither the research community nor the policy-making community knows what is like topical within the other. So uh, researchers don't know too much about what's happening in the policy framework, uh, and uh, uh, policymakers don't know too much about what's current in research. Uh, in the researcher study, researchers place uh, increased inter interaction with the policymaker community as their priority number one. And uh, whilst the policymakers, 89% of them respond that they perceive research as very important, 72% say that they don't actually have time to keep up with research and interact with the research community and read research. And the majority of them also say that they don't know where to find Swedish research or uh, research and uh, inter how to interact with the researchers. So both communities say that they engage too little with each other and there's a wish to be more connected to each other. Uh, a topic that also discussed in both of the studies is then that how does actually research innovation happen? Where and how does it actually take place and arise? Uh, and a clear response from both is that co-creation is needed, that we need to be very engaged with each other. Researchers need to be engaged in the policymaking process very early, uh, and uh, uh, policymakers need to be open about the policy problems that are there, and that this, that's how innovation actually happens, and also knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge of each other's communities uh, increases. However, both studies both that there are lots of bottle, bottlenecks and hinders that the current financing uh, rules, procurement rules, and uh, uh, incentive systems in both of communities are hindering this type of co-creation. 
And this is, of course, something we want to raise here, that how can we do more about that and how can we uh, increase the interaction between these two communities. So motivation from MFA side for this <laughs> seminar. Yeah, so motivation. Thank you, Janet. I think you have set uh, very much the, the scene, the frame for, for the discussion today. Just from the policy side, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, including uh, research in the work of uh, the 2030 Agenda. And uh, that is about uh, action agenda as well, which is very much the implemented uh, means of implementation agenda. Uh, particularly um, looking at uh, the last agenda, which is the sort of means of implementation, we have a, a separate action area in that that talks about uh, research and innovation. So it's very much uh, a central component in, in, um, in the work on, on uh, the 2030 uh, agenda. Uh, we know also later uh, this afternoon there will be a separate seminar uh, for the launch of the new research strategy for within the research corporation. Uh, this, I mean, I guess most of you have been been, been around for a while. You, you know that research is is a very long tradition. Support to research is a very long tradition within development aid. Uh, and this is because uh, I believe that uh, the Swedish government believes in research as part of, 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 of uh, societal development. Uh, this is not just about producing research, it's also to uh, try to build research capacity. And this is very much the, 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 the objective of uh, this new strategy also, for development countries to be able to identify and carry out research, uh, be part of the international research community. Uh, this is very much also, of course, the, the, the main argument for the Swedish support to to research in, in Sweden. So, so it's very much based on the same um, uh, rationale. Uh, we know that uh, we have a lot of research going on at the Swedish universities. Very much uh, a, a large proportion of this research has direct bearing on the work on the 2030 agenda. Uh, so, but it's not just about producing research. We also need to to some extent, make use of, of this research. So the interaction between the research side and the, and, 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 uh, the policy side is, is central. Uh, this is why, and this is the rationale, why we, we, have, uh, we are organizing this seminar, this panel today, to discuss uh, the interaction between research and the work on, on the 2030 agenda. We will circulate around questions of how is the situation now? What are the main challenges or barriers that we, we encounter in this interaction? But maybe importantly also uh, discuss with the panel and also in interaction with you, the audience, um, on what is the way forward? How can we increase the, the interaction of, of research uh, into policy uh, making? What, what do we need to, to do? So for this, without further ado, uh, I think we will enter into the panel uh, discussion. Uh, we have prepared the panelists with a few questions. First with the audience. <laughs> sorry, first with the audience. First with the audience. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping ahead the program here. So we have a few questions for the for the audience yes, first to start off. Yes, we would first want to know who you are, who are here, and what you think of these questions by just raising your hands. Just checking who is from who are researchers, research community here. Good, quite many, majority perhaps, and who is representing the policy community here? Mm, few. Anything else? Third option. Yeah, you are in between. Yeah, you are like a brave. Yeah, good, good. And uh, they are as well. Great. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, it is important to bridge research and policy making in the implementation of 2030 agenda. Raise your hand if you think it's important. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Almost everyone, at least. <laughs> good. But, okay, next one. Research is well integrated into Swedish development policy. Well integrated into Swedish development policy. Mm. 
Like two or three hands. Okay, good. There we have some questions to discuss then. Uh, then for the researchers, as a researcher, I know how to contribute with my findings to Swedish policy. One. Okay, the rest of you don't know. No, it's a very similar finding in our study that the researchers say that they don't actually know who are the policymakers. So it's very good to know that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, as a practitioner then, those who were practitioners, I know how to access relevant research to feed into my work. Two. Okay, good. Three. Great. Then we know a bit about the, how you think of it, and I hope we can discuss more. But now to the panel. <laughs> well, sorry for jumping ahead. Uh, this was some food for thought, maybe for the panel also, to see the, the response on, on these uh, questions. So, but I will start by uh, presenting the eminent panel that we have here today uh, to discuss this topic. We have uh, Thomas Enquist, Chair of CEDA Scientific Advisory Board. Welcome. Ingrid Öborn, Chair of the Committee for Development Research at the Swedish Research Council. Uh, Anders Hagfeldt, Vice Chancellor at Uppsala University. Uh, Ulle Peter uh, Ottesen, uh, President of Karolinska Institute. And Gabriel Bigström, Government uh, National Coordinator for Agenda 2030. So, very welcome to you all. Um, I will start. Uh, on sort of a question that addresses the, the, the situation. And uh, I think I will, will pass this one to the, to the policy side, uh, which means um, Gabriel in the first place. Uh, and, uh, but maybe also for the vice chancellors to reflect on this question uh, as well. This, the question follows. Uh, how are you at your institute organization integrating science into policy making on the 2030 agenda? Could you provide some concrete example of successful project programs? Uh, yes, well, first of all, thank you for having me at this eminent panel. Um, I would say that um, for me, I, I am actually, a for, for me, formally I'm uh, working as an inquiry. Uh, independent from the government office. And in that capacity, we have me and my team has focused quite a lot on research and how to um, start a dialogue with the research community, but also how could we uh, promote projects that um, uh, take on the very difficult question on how to speed up the transformation process in society. So I have actually two examples of what we are doing currently. And the first one is that we are working with the Stockholm Environment Institute, who has developed a model on that they call SDG synergies. I'm sure that many people in here know about this model. But it has um, primarily been directed towards um, uh, uh, countries and uh, national governments. How to because the, the, the aim of the model is to see how few of the SDGs do you need to work with in order to reach as many, many of the SDGs as possible. But we have seen that this is a demand also for the uh, municipalities in Sweden. They also have this uh, difficulty. And, we have, and now we have worked with five municipalities and we have linked them to uh, SEE SEI and, and they have developed this model uh, at the local level with quite a high degree of success. And the other thing that you actually addressed in your introduction is about uh, how do you create policy. And I think that um, one of the problems is that the government office and the parliament uh, still believes that policy is formed as it is in the theoretical model. You have a problem and then you have all these steps and then you have a proposition and then you change reality. But everyone here probably knows that this is not the case, that uh, you have all these steps and you mix them depending on which problem that you are facing and, 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 and uh, which one that is addressing the problem. Um, so we are trying to um, work 
well realized uh, an idea that has been discussed quite for a long time about policy labs. A policy lab where you could actually uh, put all the uh, actors around the same table and identify problems and identify solutions and then you identify on which political level they should be implemented and addressed. Um, and, and we are doing this uh, around uh, the very difficult question of uh, promotion and prevention. So this is two examples of what we're doing current, uh, at the moment. I think you were addressed as well. Your, yeah. No, it's OK. <laughs> OK, let's uh, first say on, on, um, on a very general note that uh, I think this is exactly what we need to do to bring science and policy making uh, together, these, these events, uh, this type of event is uh, essential. I think Rudyard Kipling said that East is West, East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. And I think he thought about this uh, very question when he wrote this uh, long, long time back. Uh, so so this, is, this is really key. Um, and I must say on a personal note that uh, the essence, uh, the importance of this issue is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I was working uh, as a chair of a Lancet Commission some years back in time. And uh, what we saw quite clearly is exactly this, the need for a better integration between policy and science. The, um, the topic of this Lancet Commission was exactly the same as the topic we're discussing today, uh, inequities, how to deal with inequities uh, in a long-term perspective. So congratulations to Globe Life for hosting uh, this particular event. It's a very seminal and important event. So how do we proceed from this very uh, overarching principle? Well, at KI, we are trying our best, but uh, we have to be a bit humble. It's, uh, it's an uphill struggle. And uh, one thing that uh, really represents a challenge is uh, the uh, difference when it comes to timelines. We're talking about the difficulties of having time zones in the science because we have to deal with scientists in other parts of the world. But this is nothing compared with the different timelines that uh, we have to uh, be attentive to when it comes to science and uh, politics. I mean, we, as scientists, we have the privilege to um, be long-termists, that's a new word, to adhere to long-termism. I mean, we have the possibility of working with a very long time horizon. But uh, in every encounter with uh, politics, of course, we realize that uh, this is a privilege that is not shared by the politicians. They have to work on a shorter timeline. I think this is one of the major obstacles for getting science into politics and uh, versa versa. But at KI, one of the things we are trying to implement is uh, a new mode, I would say, of cooperation with other countries, and not in this case, uh, South Sahar Saharan Africa. Uh, we have, as uh, many of you perhaps know, we have established a new center. It's called the Center of Excellence for Sustainable Health, where the term sustainable health is doing exactly this, pointing to the long-termism, the need to have a long time horizon for everything we do. And in this particular project involving not least uh, Uganda and Makerere University, we are trying to look beyond the first publication to see how can we go one step further. Don't leave the research project when the first publication is out, but to see how the results can finally be implemented in new policies. So one term that I would like to see being in place, but uh, I don't uh, see that so many respond positively to this, but uh, well, repetition is an art. Implementation readiness level, that when we engage in a research project, we should from the very beginning ponder what will it take to implement these results into new policies. And of course, implement, implementation research is, is key in this particular 
um, issue when it comes to this particular issue. I have some concrete projects that I would like to mention, but now I spend too much of your time and perhaps my time, so I leave it for the next intervention. Thanks, uh, and it's a very important question, of course, and I, I think when I think about it, it's at different levels. One level is what do we do as much specific, concrete as, as possible. Uh, one sort of low-hanging fruit, in a way, is to work on our, with ourselves, uh, our campuses, our buildings. Uh, and there I do see a lot of things happening with the collaboration with Akademiska Hus, for example. How do we think about energy production or energy savings in the buildings? And, and there is a, a, a lot of actions going on there. Uh, biodiversity on our campuses. Uh, also to think about... Uh, uh, yeah, production and consuming, how do we buy things and so on. So that's very concrete, I would say, with, with our administration in a sense and the planning building division. Uh, then I think about what are we doing in a more research educational aspect. Uh, and I, I do hear when I go and meet uh, research centers or departments that they, this is our research. And I remember, for example, for the pharmaceutical department developing new drugs and so on. And they, they immediately when they say this is our sort of uh, goals and targets and this is how we link it to the SDGs and so on. So, that, so that's very interesting to see and I, I see that quite often actually. Uh, on more futuristic uh, and then we have on education a long-term uh, sustainable uh, platform uh, run by students for, for, for many, many years called CMUS. Uh, I think that's a very interesting um, platform. In terms of more coming up things, uh, we are at the moment planning for, a, a, let's say, a strong initiative on bringing together sustainable development questions. Uh, of course, you realize when you become vice chancellor that it's a lot of things going on, but can we coordinate this and make it powerful? Can we uh, make it stronger? And, and uh, that's what we're looking into. And I would like to see a, 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 a quite powerful support from Uppsala University. I have, when I, I sort of put the, the groups together to work with it, I had a very loose uh, let's say, a uh, directive, as you say in Swedish, uh, make something different than already exists is probably what I said, something like that, and which could be what could be a bit unique with Uppsala in working with these issues. And, and I think one thing which, which we discuss here is the um, conflicts of goals. You have different goals and you have to sort of, uh, and then you have to, how do you meet them? I think that almost requires research in itself. How do you work with complex issues where you have so many conflicting uh, goals and how do you sort of create something from there. I think that's interesting. Another um, uh, support we're looking into is to work with, uh, with uh, Africa as a continent. We have also there several initiatives. I see Bengt Ove from International Science Programs who have done this for 60 years. Uh, and others also work with that and can we coordinate this effort a bit and, and create something interesting in Uppsala on, on uh, Africa as, as a uh, continent to collaborate with and, and uh, so on. So we, I see this is very exciting to come up. I think also when we discuss co-create, working with policy and politicians, industry, we are a little bit stuck in our boxes in a way. We, we, and we discussed it over lunch, Ole Petro. We talk from the university a lot of our autonomy. We should not let anyone say, tell us what to do. And the politician I think, thinks the same. We should do this and, and uh, sort of. I think we have to lose a little bit and also be humble that we also have to engage and inclu include others when we discuss. We can't just do research for five years think now we know everything, now we can tell the politicians what they should decide, and the politician has maybe two days to, to discuss this. So, so we have to be part of this in, in, in together also when we build up what we are doing and implement. It's not only to create, but also to implement. And I think we need long-term aspects. Uh, this takes time to develop uh, trust, collaboration, 
not the least when we are collaborating with uh, other countries and our institutes. So, so I would think that uh, that one thing we need to ask for when we ask for funding and so on is that think about this as this takes time. It, it's not only three years project from VR or from SIDA or what we think. This We have to build up things in long term. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Um, anyone from the panel that would like to supplement or add something to to the discussion from uh, Sida or well, <clears throat> I think I think I heard some some very interesting ideas coming up here, and, and uh, just some reflections from I'm representing the research community and and uh, the Sida scientific advisory board. Uh, so the word co-creation came up, and I think it's really a key concept uh, <clears throat> when uh, talking about bridging science and policy. But there are, I think, three very important um, parts of co-creation. One is the co-design, where you together uh, identify what is the problem and how you're going to go about to, to solve that. Then you have the process of co-production, which is where you together interpret results and produce the knowledge needed. But the third part, I think, is crucially important and has been overlooked uh, and that is the co-implementation and implementation has been <clears throat> mentioned but I think we still lack very much uh, clear incentives uh, for the research community to engage in implementation processes particularly long term even though we know they are so important it's a very important learning part of what <clears throat> what succeeded what failed uh, and so I think that's where you have a mutual interest among policymaker practitioners. And, and if we have the incentives for the research community to engage, I think a very fruitful process. So when we're talking about co-creation and importance, I think we should reflect on these three dimensions. And the last one, still, we need to push much harder for and, 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 and develop um, incentive structures for. <coughs> Yeah, and I can add a little bit to this with some of the experiences and work we are doing in the Swedish Research Council uh, just now. So looking at it from the researcher's perspective, I think to, to start, I mean, you've, yeah, projects are three years, but I mean, your career scientists are usually many more years. So the thing is to, to keep learning and, and, and sort of adding on from, from one project to another and build, build groups and so on. So what we've been doing now, I mean, is to work further on the relevance you know, one, if you have applied for money from the research council, you know that you need to say if this is relevant for, for, for development, for poverty elevation, eradication, and sustainable development. But we have taken it much further to be much more concrete. So, so think when you plan your project, how will this contribute? And even think about, okay, so what will be the pathways to impact for this project? So this is the first year, I mean now, when we asked scientists to do that in their applications. And we're looking forward to see, I mean, some of you might have read the applications, I have not, to see, okay, so how, how did they manage? Because if we think about this from the beginning, and it's graded with as many grades and all other criteria, science quality, you know, and, and so on, and it will be a part of the evaluation. So I think that will really lead to a, a learning among the scientists to start to think. Um, a, a, another way, uh, which we haven't managed because it requires more funding, but which I have experienced from other bigger projects is to actually bring on board both the communication people and policy institutions in the, in the research team from the beginning. I mean, in the beginning, they might have a low profile or a high in the design, it depends a little bit on, but very soon when they see, we work for example with IGAD in the Horn of Africa. In the first year, they were only like said something about sites. But then after a year and a half when we met again and they said, okay, you're actually doing something. That's what concrete examples. And now they approach us, you know, so we easily, or our research partners in Kenya, Uganda, can come and tell and it become concrete examples. So it's really start to be snowballing very, very early before any publications, but just see things on the ground. So I think if we manage to get at least some calls big enough to actually bring in sort of policy actors and communications people from the beginning, because we are not always that good in, in communicating. So without them, maybe IGAD wouldn't have understood how they could you know, benefit from the researchers after one year. So that's just some examples how, how we can be working and how we try to work. Thank you very much. 
Um, just uh, if you can very short uh, reflect upon what you think are the main barriers for the internet. You have been touching on this, but if you can just put some words on, on each of you, what are the main barriers now uh, or challenges that are now hindering the interaction between science and uh, policy making, specifically in, in relation to the 2030 agenda? Ingrid, maybe you can start. Okay. Yes, so one thing I think is that the same, we, as scientists were not really trained at thinking about sort of the long term effects because we've become so tactical and strategic in, in getting new research grants and new PhD students in. So we need to have incentives for a different behavior, I think. And then of course the leaders of the universities can sort of help to see how to, to develop that. Uh, but I also think it is to to be able to have a bigger funding for the different projects and I say also bring in components of, of communications and other things from, from the beginning. So I think that the short term thinking, even if you talk about long terminus, what did you call it? Uh, scientists are living in a three year cycle world and I think that is hindering. Should I continue? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I agree with what, what you said, and I think uh, overall um, barriers are linked to incentive structures the, or lack of incentives, uh, both in the academic community and policy community. So for example, um, you would need much more engagement from policy and practice in, in the academic part in, in sort of reviewing uh, papers and in, in sort of the academic pu publication process, but there are no incentives for someone in policy and practice to participate spend half a day of reviewing a paper and, and you get no re reward. So there, there is a need for rethinking how we could reward people from policy and practice in, in sort of increasing the quality of the academic part. And then for in, in the academic community, we need uh, new incentives, as I said before, for participating in the implementation process and particularly in the long term. I think that's very, very crucial and we need to think hard how we could come about to do that. Yeah, I also agree on the long term as we discussed. And I'm thinking a little bit more on the sort of different boxes we are using. I, I think the government in a way says, well, we say that here is the amount of money. We send it to, let's say, the research council to distribute it, to make calls. And the, the, the funding agency says, well, we make a call and then researchers apply. And then we don't talk with each other. It's sort of... That, and we shouldn't talk with each other also. Is, is, I think we need to rethink that a little bit. And we say sometimes when we do that, we call it lobbying, and that's a negative word, but it doesn't need to be that. If we say co-creation is a very positive word, and I've seen also European networks which are much more lobbying in a positive way, and I think we can learn from that also uh, in Sweden, actually. So to be a little bit more open and humble to say that we can actually learn from each other and we can create something together and be, be on the same journey, in a sense. And, and I don't know, uh, one can... Uh, kind of new Hadipsund, in a way. <laughs> it could be interesting in politics and science, for example. Well, I, I would like to underline something that Thomas said, or, or the point you we're making that uh, we are lacking incentives, uh, especially in politics nowadays, where science is not <laughs> on the very top of the political agenda, to say the least. Um, but also in the research community, um, I would think that it is quite hard to make a career of, of getting involved in, in policy. And uh, getting involved in policy um, requires you to make compromises and making compromises with your own research is, I could imagine, not that easy. Uh, so, um, co-creation, you, you and many other point to, I think that is really the way forward and trying to find um, uh, organized ways of, of uh, scientists to be uh, employed in uh, municipalities in government and so on and and politicians to on the well i think that is really harder to get the other way around but get to get the scientists in uh, government and in uh, municipalities and regions is the easy part 
Yes, yeah, so I think it was a very interesting thing to hear that uh, we, as scientists, uh, we have a shorter term in our thinking and planning than the founding bodies. It's an interesting uh, discussion. Um, the thing is, no scientist is an island. That's the essence. It's true, of course, that an individual scientist might have a short-term ambition for his or her own career development. But the point is that every scientist is part of a research community. And the essence is that this research community, in this case, for example, of a center for sustainable health, if this scientific community has a long-term vision, this will be reflected in the research carried out by the individual scientist. So there is a huge difference between what is the time perspective of an individual scientist and what should be the time perspective, the time horizon for the community of which this scientist is a part. So I think that uh, the scientific community has an obligation, um, duty I think, to ensure that each scientist is part of a community with this long-term vision that in fact ends, hopefully, in the implementation of research into better policies. As you know, there have been people saying that you can stop all research and just focus on implementation, and that will be good enough for Africa, for example, for five, ten years to come. I mean, there is a tremendous lag when it comes to the implementation of new results. Uh, for example, one thing that came up just a few days ago is the lag when it comes to the implementation of knowledge on schistosomiasis in South Saharan Africa. That's just one example, and there are many, many others. Um, one obstacle that uh, I see very well is, in fact, and we have touched upon this, is that... Uh, we should, and this is something we should be also self-critical of, we as a scientific community should be even more willing than we are today to uh, get out of our comfort zones and to work on an interdisciplinary level. I mean, there are some very good examples that came up uh, in an earlier panel today, for example. I mean, the Ebola uh, uh, epidemic in Africa is just one example. I mean, how can you deal with such a disease without knowing the tradition, the culture, of the community in which uh, Ebola uh, arises. That's just one example. Um, there, is, there are many other examples which certainly require not only that we respond to the local needs, but that we understand the local possibilities when it comes to implementation. So there is a need also in Sweden, I think, to increase substantially the interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary effort. Uh, today, I, I was... Um, alluding to the possibility of um, increasing our ambitions to form a sort of uh, parallel to Davos, to really have a global forum for discussing interdisciplinarity when it comes to these very tricky and difficult questions. And uh, I don't think I'm naive. I think there is a way to really increase our ambitions when it comes to this. But one final thing, an obstacle. We should not only think across disciplines. I mean, we have to think along the entire sort of value chain when it comes to the way from education to research to implementation. We have to ensure that we can engage the global players. What happened now in South Africa? They came up with production facilities for vaccines, and uh, they saw that... Uh, the market mechanisms were not in place to sustain the production of new vaccines in South Africa. That means that we have to engage the World Bank and whatever, so the global players that need to be in place so that we have the entire value chain intact. We are far from doing this. And that means that many projects, even driven from Sweden, they fail because we don't engage the entire set of actors that need to be in place to see research being implemented. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting reflections. Uh, there seemed to be um, a consensus uh, in the panel uh, around uh, the problem of, of shell at the barriers and so on. Um, 
we know also, uh, at least when t talking from the policy side, that uh, we have a lot of, of different policy processes, not least within development aid, all the country strategies and so on, that we are producing uh, regularly. Uh, we know that we are talking very much about uh, the need to, to engage with the research community and to have so-called science-based knowledge into the, into the process. Um, we also know that uh, the scientific community is pretty uh, absent in these uh, different processes when we have startup meetings and so on for the strategy. So the last question is very much uh, going to more hands-on to say, okay, we know the situation, we know the relevance, we know also the barriers and the challenges. Concrete examples of what can we do? What can we do to increase the interaction between policy uh, and science? From the science side, but also from the policy side. I give the floor to, to, to Ingrid to start again, if, if, if you want. Yes. Yeah, of course, it's not exactly easy to say what can we do. And I also know scientists who actually try to engage, I mean, for example, the, the, the country programs where they were quite uninterested in research because that was in another strategy. So maybe you also need to think about how these different government strategies relate. And because people really feel that this is our money and this is your money, don't try to push research into the agenda for this and that country because it should be paid by another box. So, so I think also people have tried, uh, but not so successful a, a year or so ago. Uh, but of course, we, we should not give up. So, but I would also like to see it from another direction. I mean, in the new strategy, um, it really says that we are going to work on equal terms with our collaborators in, in the least developed or some middle, low and middle income countries. And I think that also needs to be the point of departure for the policy, because if we just see it from the Swedish perspective, and it is about the development um, policies and, and so on, I, I don't think we get anywhere. So most of the things I've learned in interdisciplinary work, in working like from science to, to innovation policy and practice, has very much been both in international research organizations and in collaboration with national partners in the least developed or low middle income countries. So I would like, I think if we take it from there, we can bring scientists on board being very engaged in, in those different national and regional collaborations and like not only think about the Swedish side, because I think we are more stuck on the Swedish side than we actually are in, in, in the development on the ground. Thank you. So, um, well, I've been thinking a lot about what to actually to do to promote more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and what you could actually do to, to um, have more success. And, I think I come to the conclusion that it's a question about mindset uh, to a large extent. And, and maybe by using um, what I call framed creativity, it, it could be a way forward. And what I mean by framed creativity is actually you, you d define sort of the, the game plan, but then you let actors be very creative within that, uh, within that frame. And I could give you one example. Um, we in the Scientific Advisory Board are discussing as part of perhaps what, what could be um, a part of opera to operationalize um, the new strategy, which you will hear more about this afternoon. Um, the concept of uh, One Health, and I think Ole might agree that it, it's a very exciting concept um, that would create a mindset for uh, a frame creativity because it, it sort of emphasizes how you link planetary health with human health. Or anything in between. So it would include natural science, technology, but social science, economy, <clears throat> uh, human science and medicine, of course, but um, in a new way where you actually l emphasize the linkage between planetary health, as you understand it, and, and human health, and how you're going to go to maintain that health uh, in the long term. So I think that's an example of how you could create something that will uh, perhaps, perhaps induce more collaboration among scientists that haven't collaborated and also uh, be very policy relevant. 
Thank you. Um, we have in Uppsala a very interesting center called Circus, uh, and, and that is dealing with uh, interdisciplinarity, which we all agree is very important, but this deals not on a specific topic, but how to do interdisciplinary research and support that. And, and I find that very interesting as, as a topic and it's been very successful and, and in support to create interdisciplinary centre for various things, uh, but also looking into research and, and when I mentioned that to, to um, directors of funding agencies or, or politicians, people get quite in, uh, excited and interested, what is this? So I think there is, for example, a chance to, to invite politicians to start to discuss, we are handling complex issues, how do we actually do it? Well, it's a topical, interdisciplinary, but it's also in, intersectorial uh, effort we need to do. And, and, uh, and I think that could be a starting point to also invite politicians to, to do that. There is. Another discussion going on in the country on, uh, on the uh, enormous need of competences in new technologies. For example, uh, uh, electric cars. I need 10,000 new engineers to handle batteries. The combustion engine engineers are, are old and they need, it's a complete transformation of, of the need of new engineers. How do we support as a country that many engineers? And you can go through the pharmaceutical industry and others, and uh, and sustainable development, of course. So, uh, and there is a discussion actually going on between researchers and uh, our ministry, for example. How, how how do we handle such? We can't handle that alone completely. And what is nice also, not only one university can handle so many uh, students. So, so it has to be a national effort at many levels. So there are examples coming up, I think. Well, I think there are a couple of things that we can do and uh, first of all we have a tendency to focus at the national level and you equalize uh, policy with national politics. I think that we should start with the local level, municipalities. Uh, we have many small municipalities not only in Sweden but around the world and they lack knowledge and they lack many times resources and for them to have access to the latest research science is tremendously important. It could make the difference for them when it comes to um, uh, how to, to use their resources, uh, resources wise, wiseful and, and uh, to, uh, in, in so many areas. So focusing on the local level should be key. The next thing is that we have many fields, uh, disciplinaries where we do a lot of research and then we don't take care of what has what we have found and you were talking about implementation and uh, this is of course especially true when it comes to promotion prevention uh, in in um, in health where uh, we do a lot of research and then we have no national body that will uh, take care of this research and that will see to it that it is uh, updated and and so on and this is a and we have the same situation in many other fields and this is a waste of money <laughs> and um, the third thing is that if we should focus at the local level and if we will do more inventions at the local level we have a problem that we are quite bad at uh, sharing and spreading good examples around the country and and we are in this country at least we are uh, also not that very good at importing good <laughs> policy solutions from other countries we are more focusing on exporting uh, policy solutions than importing them and i think that uh, we really need to do something about it because uh, it won't work in, in in a world that is facing uh, such a huge challenges Thank you. Yes, so the question is, uh, what can we do uh, to increase this uh, interaction? I must say I was shocked uh, when, uh, Janet, when you mentioned the result of uh, your survey here. If I understand correctly, you said that among policymakers, 72% say that they there is no time 
they have no time to keep up with research. Was that correct? I mean, think about it, what this means. This is really serious business. And it tells us that uh, we have to improve. My suggestion is uh, very simple. And that is that uh, this should not be a singular event. We should establish in Sweden a multi-stakeholder platform where we discuss these issues. But there is one stakeholder that is, uh, I think, missing here. And that is, that is a stakeholder that often falls into disrespute when we discuss these matters. But industry has to be brought along. I didn't th see a single representative from the industry here. Is, is that true? Not a single one. But look at what happened during the pandemic. They are part of the problem, yes. But they must also be part of the solution. A multi-stakeholder platform. It can be established tomorrow. But it has to engage, of course, the local community aspects, but also, as I said, the global aspects. So this multi-stakeholder platform must invite and challenge, for example, those that are responsible for establishing functioning markets in lower resource settings. We have to invite the World Bank. We have to invite the global governance system. I mean, we can do that tomorrow. And this could be the beginning. There's one, thing, one additional thing which uh, I think is uh, very, very important. And this is uh, a touch of self-criticism. And I think uh, our funding bodies alluded to this issue. We as universities, we as scientists, and I include myself, we are so concerned about our status in society with reference to what we are good at. But perhaps we should ask ourselves, what are we good for? And we could do that without encroaching on the academic freedom because it's part of the third task of the universities. Ask not only what you are good at, but what you are good for. And then we will see that we can make progress and establish also a priori contacts with policymakers without fearing losing out on academic freedom. There is no automatic contrast between the two. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, time is, is, is running. Uh, maybe we should just give uh, the panel a round of applause for their contributions and discussions. Thank you. And um, now I'll hand over to, to Jant. Yes, we will continue, of course, with you <laughs> and uh, want to know any ideas that have come. We have a couple of minutes. Any ideas from you or questions to the panel, please? Yes. Hello, I'm Stefan Swarton Peterson. Uh, I've heard a lot about getting research into policy and practice, but I was sort of wondering, can research questions come out of policy and practice and how? Let's take a couple of more. Klaus, yeah, please. Hi, Southbound Sao University, uh, working a lot with, with interdisciplinary approaches uh, related to the sustainable future. And I would say there are a lack of incentives. Somebody said it's one of the key issues here is incentives. And I would say it's a lack of incentives for co creation, and there is a lack of incentives in academia for outreach. I mean, we count how many publications and staff presentations we have, but there are very small incentives or co-creating or having an impact on, on the policy, on the real world, so to say. And there we need other incentives, both for co-creation and for um, using research for societal development. So, yeah. Good. Let's take one uh, more. Yes. Hi, my name is Kaylee and I'm a student here at Uppsala University. And I was sharing uh, your smile when you said that you seem to have a discrepancy in timelines and opinion on that timeline. So I just wanted to ask the question again to the panel, is the solution or one of the solutions faster research? Because there seems again to be a discrepancy in who has the short-term goals and who has the long-term goals. So I just wanted to ask that question back to the panel. Good, thanks. And I think one, Lisa, there as well. Thank you. I'm Lisa Roman from CEDA. I think it's great when policy and research meets like this. We need to do that much more, collaborate. But I would also like to stress that it's very, very important and, uh, and the problem for 
the bureaucracy to be literate, research literate, to actually understand the body of knowledge out there. And of course, the research community can help in, in, in enlarging that, given that the incentives are there from both parties. But this is also very important in, uh, in countries, low-income countries actually are the object for, for, for this type of research. And that the, there are research literacy there among uh, research decision makers and that's where uh, Swedish universities can also be of assistance in order to build that sort of uh, capacity in, in uh, these communities as well as as important as our internal dialogue. Good and the last one there you and then oh, we thank take you. Yeah uh, <laughs> thank you so much for, for the discussion but it's a, a little bit disturbing given the uh, opinions in the plenary earlier this morning about the urgency of the matter we're talking about long term, we're talking about three year periods. We just heard that we're missing opportunity by the day. So how, how are we going to use the knowledge we have now? What new structures are? How, how, where is the transformation in this or the revolution or whatever you would like to call it? Thank you. Good, thanks a lot. And now we have five minutes, so I will give you all like 40 seconds each, actually, to take like pick, pick one of the questions and to have some final words, if you have, uh, from the panel. <laughs> okay, so I will pick the one about the discrepancy in, in the timeline. I mean, I, I think, you know, we can't really do like quick research, but you can have a different type of, of interaction. So if we, from the beginning in the process, sort of engage with both communication and, and, and policy and practice, there will be things coming out from the research process because it's not so much always about like results after many years, but just the design, just the approach, the research questions, the ones engaged. So I think if we see it as a sort of a continuous interaction, then it's both feeding in and sort of coming out things from, from this core learning process in the different steps that, that um, Thomas outlined. So I think that that would be, be one way to sort of try to, to combine the robustness in the research but not saying you have to wait for 10 years, but we can actually inter inter interact from sort of the design of the project. And then we can also respond to the question how research question can come out of the policy processes, because then that will happen in that process. Good. 40 seconds. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, I would address the, the, the first question on research problems emerging from policy and practice, of course. And, and uh, I would view that as a very natural outcome of, if you think about this uh, co-design, co-production, co-implementation as sort of a, a cycle that goes on over time, uh, of course, uh, problems and challenges emerging in practice and policy will will then be picked up and, and scientists engaging in finding solutions and then you test the solutions and so on. And I also think the urgency question will relate to that because when you feel that urgency, you will naturally speed up the process in, within that and, and speed up the learning. Yeah, a quick response to examples of uh, where I felt that with policy can create research uh, sort of questions and input. Uh, one is this network, the Guild, as I mentioned. I, I think I'm surprised. I, I'm very new to it, but but uh, uh, I do hear from uh, from from the Guild, and we have an ex excellent director that the European Commission come to ask questions to the Guild. We are do doing this, and and. There are questions asked, and it, I think it has to do a lot on trust. And you have built up that you can, the politician, some of them actually understand that they don't understand science, so they ask the questions to scientists, and that is to encourage, of course. Uh, secondly, is my own example 25 years ago when we had money for solar cell research from the Energy Agency. I was a young researcher, and to my surprise, they opened up the dialogue. Uh, we were maybe the, almost the only one in Sweden working with solar cells, so it was not so many others to talk to maybe. But, but anyway, I, I felt that very, very stimulating that they asked what we want solar cell research uh, and we want it to, to happen and we wanted to apply it, but it's important. So we could discuss basic research, we could discuss implementation, how do you... So it was a an, an, an dialogue which I find very fruitful. So it can happen. Um, well, I, I just wanted to say something about the result from the uh, inquiry. I think that, yes, many polit most politicians hasn't 
haven't read uh, an article or a, a scientific report, but they have read an inquiry or a government report. And that's the way how uh, uh, ministers and, and parliamentarians get their information and the latest news from the, from the uh, scientific community. Um, I think the real problem isn't that they um, won't get the answers to different problems. The real uh, problem is that they need help, policymakers need help to formulate the questions that the inquiries will answer. And there, I think, uh, uh, you need a real collaboration between the scientific community and the policymakers. Um, thank you. I would like to address the question from uh, the student. What is your name again? Kelly? Yes. Because I think it's a um, fundamental issue that you're addressing through your question. We just had a discussion at KI about exactly this. How to allow for slow science? Uh, slow science has a negative connotation in Sweden. But uh, in this discussion, there was a student from Harvard. Slow science is really what is needed. That was the mantra from our colleague from Harvard. And of course, there are instruments in place many, in many other parts of the world where you can do slow science without being harnessed into the short time frame of projects from VR or other funding bodies. But this is, in fact, a responsibility also of the universities and the, the university presidents to, to see to it that when there are interesting projects that we know will take time to mature. We should have an instrument in place for slow science. Unfortunately, we don't have that in Sweden. But the most important thing is that the timeline is not, as I said, only determined from the point of view of the individual researchers, but from the point of view of the research community of which you are a part. Just one second to Stefan. I think what hasn't surfaced in this discussion and that relates to this interaction between science and policy, is the issue of secondments, internships. I don't think Sweden is on the top of the list when it comes to having scientists that's seconded to, for example, WHO or to EU system or to the, F the U UN system. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I don't think we are at the top of the list. Perhaps we should improve that and ensure that we get our best scientists for a time being also into the even supranational governing bodies. That is an interaction that is needed. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much to the audience for coming. I think uh, one thing at least that we have learned from here is this, this discussion needs to continue, <laughs> that we need to maybe start up the multi-platform tomorrow to discuss it further. But uh, at least within Swedev, uh, we are continuously in this discussion and want to increase the interaction with the researchers in different thematic areas, ge geographic areas and policymakers. So we are trying to be that link and uh, have, be a matchmaker. So please, if you are already not involved in Swedev's activities, please uh, join our assembly tomorrow, 4.45 in uh, uh, room four, I think, at least in this building, uh, and uh, come and talk to us more, or you can also join online, uh, or you can uh, join in other, other ways as well afterwards. And to the panel, I just want to give you uh, the two studies I was talking about. <laughs> and as a small gift with the, uh, with the figures as well. And there are some uh, uh, suggested oh, solutions from us uh, on what to do. But I think we have heard much more today uh, uh, from the panel. So we need to make a third study, I think, uh, with all the ideas. But. Uh, Yes, thank you from me. And Mons, do you want to say the final words? I uh, just want to say that it seems like we have run out of oxygen in this room now. It's very hot. <laughs> it has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, and I think we all agree that it needs to, to continue. Uh, and we need to find, especially the, the, the interaction points and the forums where we can continue to discuss this also, so that we can go from discussion to something also real when it comes to the interaction. So thank you very much, uh, panelists, and thank you very much, audience, for joining this session.